left off with number three. Correct? Yeah. And we did not do number four. No. All right. What's the key on number four? What's the thing you're going to have to know to solve number four? Um. What's this mean? to the third power which is is it length is it area is it volume volume okay that's what we're going to need to know so tell me the volume of a that's our master equation now some of this geometry stuff it's been a while for you i'm sure I mean, uh, it's yeah. probably been three years since you've studied geometry. Okay. So, do you know that's a prism? So, the volume is the area of the base times the thickness of it. Well, the area of the base is pi r squared times the height. Now, that's height right there even though it's not standing on end, it's still height. Same with B. That's also a cylinder, which is also a prism. And all prisms are the area of the base times the thickness of the prism. Now, we're going to go back and First of all, we need to figure out the volume of each of these figures. What's the volume of a sphere? Uh, pi r cubed, right? Four-thirds pi r cubed. And this is not a sphere. This is a half of a sphere. So what's this one going to be? One-half, four-thirds pi r cubed. Right. Or... Which is two-thirds pi r cubed. So that's the volume of each of these. <clears throat> now, water is being pumped into the tank at a constant rate. For each of the tanks, sketch the graph of the height of the water in the tank as a function of time. Assume the tank is initially empty and will be filled. When they say it's being pumped at a constant rate, which variable is that? Uh, time. Well, yeah. Hmm. For each of the tanks, sketch a graph of the height of the water in the tank as a function of time. Well, let's do the easy one, this one here. As a function of time, height. Well, the constant rate is cubic feet per minute. And what that means in calculus terminology is dv dt. This is a little bit bizarre. I'm not exactly sure. Sketch the, a graph of the height of the water in the tank as a function of time. Okay, we should be able to figure this out. If they're pumping in at, say, wow. 
This is a test that assumes you do not have calculus knowledge, is that correct? Yes. This is all based on pre-calculus. Or before, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's see. If we, if we were to make up a variable, let's say the constant rate was A, cubic feet per minute. Okay. Usually you use letters when you're talking about constants. Okay, so if I'm pumping that thing full at a cubic feet per minute, then I want to divide V by A, correct? Yeah. In other words, if I take the volume and divide it by A, the rate that it's being pumped in, that'll give me the time that it takes to fill it up. But, okay, and that's as a function of time. Well, if I divide the left side by A and divide the right side by A, now this represents the time that it's going to be filled up. So it would be pi r squared h divided by this variable a. And if they want time versus height, you can sketch a graph of that, correct? I think so. <laughs> well, they don't say sketch a graph of the height of the water in the tank as a function of time which doesn't really say that time should be the horizontal axis. Yeah, it does. It says, so we need to solve for H as a function of T. Okay, so this first one, bear with me here. This is seemingly amazingly difficult for the subject matter. There you go. There's your height on equation number one, A, rather. The height in the, th in the tank will be the time that it's been filling times the rate that it's been filling divided by pi r squared. Now, how you graph that, presumably you would use a calculator. Um, to graph that okay and we're going to do the same thing on all three of these here let's this still seems to me much more difficult than it should be <clears throat> let's first of all for each of these our goal really is to come up with an equation that relates H and T, correct? In other words, regardless of how complicated that equation is, once I can relate H to T, then I'm going to be able to graph it, even if I have to use a calculator, okay? Okay. You with me? Okay. So what we have to do is take the volume and solve come up with T. Well, one way to do it is to divide both sides by A, the rate that water is being pumped in, and that gives you the time that it takes to fill it. So again, I would have TA equals H divided by pi R squared. Ah, that was the same equation for the first one as it should be. Those two things are both cylinders, I think. I, I don't know. This is a very strange problem. Uh, over here, we got full V divided by A equals that divided by A. So now we have TA uh, 3 halves divided by pi R cubed equals... Ooh, there's no H on this. Well, what is H? 
<clears throat> H is half of a radius. So one half R. Wouldn't it just be one radius? Ah, yeah. It's a full radius. You're right. Absolutely. And then you can divide both sides by R, uh, making that R to the fourth, making that one. <clears throat> but that, actually, let's go back and make that R to the third and leave that as R because R is also H. So there would be the function that relates H to T. Uh, I'm not comfortable with that problem. First of all, I'm not exactly sure what they're looking for. I kind of have an idea. I know that you have to figure out the volume of each of those three shapes. And it seems to me like volume over their constant rate would equal the time, but that would be the time to fill it completely. So... I don't want to waste any more time on this problem. I know we have a lot to cover, and you got a big test coming up to Monday, correct? Yep. Let's not spend all of our time on a problem like that. Let's see what this is. The lift L of an airplane wing at takeoff is proportional to the square of the speed s of the plane and the area of its wings. Now this one is a more typical pre-calculus problem. If I tell you y is proportional to x, what's the equation? It's y equal some constant times x. That's what that means. If I tell you that y is proportional to x, okay? If I say it's inversely proportional, then it's this. And those are the only two you really have to remember. But always remember there's a k there. And the K is different depending on what the problem is. This is about airplane wings and speed of the plane. But you can have all kinds of problems that have different Ks. But this means directly proportional. And this means inversely proportional. So tell me what my equation is for this. L is the lift, is proportional to the square of the speed. So we know there's a K. That's not a variable. That's a constant. What else? Would it be over A? Well, it's not and over. It's, it's proportional. It's not inversely proportional. So times A. And then all of it squared. Well, now hold on. Let's go from left to right. The L is proportional to the square of the speed. That's what that looks like. And the area of its wings. Nowhere does it say inversely. And notice what the difference is. If you look at these two equations, on the direct proportional, when x increases, y increases, no matter what k is. When x decreases, y decreases. So when th two things are directly proportional, it means when one thing goes up, the other goes up. As opposed to this one, where it's inverse proportional, in this one, when x goes up, y goes down. And when X goes down, Y goes up. Okay? Okay. Now, if you look at this problem in the context of it, if you're flying an airplane, the lift, meaning the power forcing you up, is that going to be directly proportional or in inversely proportional? 
directly proportional. Yeah, because the faster your speed is, the more lift you're going to get, right? Yeah. And the greater your area of your wings, the more lift. So there's nothing in this that should be divided. This is the correct equation for A. Okay. That is correct. That says exactly what their sentence said. Even though they don't use the word directly, if somebody says it's proportional, they mean directly proportional. Okay? Okay. If they mean inversely proportional, then they will have to use the word inversely. Okay. If the speed is only half as much, how much larger should the area of the wings be for the lift to be the same? So we put it into the equation? Yeah, pretty much. L is going to be the same. K is no different. But instead of S, we got one half S. That whole thing needs to be squared. Now, what does A need to be for this thing to be the same lift? If I put 2A, would that do it? What do you get when you square 1 half S? 1 fourth S. Okay. So you get lift is equal to K times one-fourth S squared. So I would need the area of the wings to be four times larger, in which case my fours would cancel, and I would be left with this lift. In other words, the speed of the airplane is more important than the area of the wings. It's squared. So if I reduce the speed by half, I'm reducing the lift by one quarter. So if I want to make up for it, I need four times the area of the wings. And that's a, a pretty important principle in flight in airplanes. You know, if you build an airplane that has a huge wingspan, well, that's good. That increases lift, but not as much as increasing the speed. So if you had to decide whether to put an extra powerful motor in there that would let you go faster, or increasing the area of the wings, I would go for the extra powerful motor. If I can double the speed, I quadruple the lift. If I leave the area of the wings the same. All right, let's move on. I don't want to get too hung up on any of these because um, we are limited for time. And this stuff here, uh, I don't see that as being the crux of what you're going to have to do on Monday in terms of taking a test. These are kind of exotic questions. All right. <clears throat> wow. Assume H0 and P are constants. Find the slope and give a practical interpretation. Well, let's, what's the first logical thing to do? In other words, I don't see anything in there that looks like y equal mx plus b, right? Yeah. So how can we get it into a form that might approximate y equal mx plus b. It's the first thing we should do. Now remember, this is a constant. That's just a number. 
That's a constant. That's just a number. And that's a constant. That's just a number. So how about first of all, we distribute the P. Okay. Okay. In other words, if you don't know what to do in math, try doing whatever you can do. The only thing I can do at this point is to distribute that P. Okay. Now what can I do? You can divide both sides by P. Mm, not really. That makes everything more complicated. Remember, this is my Y. If I'm trying to make it look like Y equal MX plus B, well, there's my slope. That's what they're asking about, right? So yeah. I'm going to try to make this look like Y equal MX plus B, and the Y is the target heart rate, R. So let's get R all on one side. So I'm going to add H sub 0. All right. Now what do we know? This is a constant. That's a constant. That's a constant, that's a constant, and that's a constant. So what's my variable? Uh, P. Oh, I've circled all the constants. What's the only thing left? A. Ah, that's not a constant. In other that's words, good. depending on a person's age, R will be different. Okay? So my real equation here is minus P times A. That's this part, the only part with a variable. And then plus all this other stuff that's just numbers. That's a constant. That's a constant. And that's a constant. All three of those are constants. They don't have anything to do. So what's the slope of this line? Remember the variable is A. Just, uh, just be P minus P. Minus P. That's the slope of that equation. Now, what does it mean? In other words, what's a practical interpretation? Well, the practical interpretation would be what? R is linearly related to A. In other words, your target heart rate is a function of a person's age. So the only thing we needed was the coefficient of A. In other words, that's what M has to be. This B up here, that's what I've circled over here. That's all constants. Those are no there's no variables in there. And so I actually do have it in the form of this. And since the only thing they asked about was the slope, that's got to be minus P. The coefficient of the variable, which is A. And the practical interpretation is your target heart rate uh, goes down, no, goes down as a person gets older. In other words, whatever P is, because there's a negative sign in front of it, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bless you. Sorry. There's all these fires burning in the west, and it's really causing Denver to be 
smoky and it's got my allergies in an uproar. All right. I don't like these questions particularly. They don't seem particularly helpful to me in understanding the material. But I'm not the one designing the test you're going to have to take tomorrow or Monday. All right. You should be able to do these. In other words, these kind of questions are taking a verbal sentence and translating it into an equation. So tell me how to write an equation that expresses what this sentence. Just work your way from left to right. How do I, how do I represent the cube of the diameter? D cubed. Is, is an equal sign. Roughly means K proportional to the square of the hurricane's duration. So what else goes over there? K squared. Or no. It'd be T squared. T squared. Yeah, the hurricane's duration is T. Okay. So that's the equation. In other words, is all I did was I read it directly from the sentence, working left to right. The cube of the diameter is roughly proportional to the square of the hurricane's duration. Now, why did I write K instead of roughly? Well, it's always a K, okay? Roughly means approximately, so they're basically saying K is near one, but that's not particularly important. What's important is that you know how to, that everything always is going to have a K in it if it's proportional stuff. Now, if that roughly would have said inversely, then the T square would have been in the denominator. If it would have said inversely proportional, now I would have d cubed equals k divided by t squared. If I change that word to inversely, which you would never do because the diameter of a hurricane is never inversely proportional to the square of the hurricane's duration. It's always directly proportional. So the t squared goes in the numerator. Solve your equation for D. What's our equation? If D cubed equals that, what is D equal? Uh, the cube of K times T. Exactly, and you can write that like that. So there's the answer for A. And now the other questions that they give, in other words, once you've come up with the formula for this model, then if they give you a bunch of variables, you just plug it in and solve. Okay, so part B. If the diameter is 302 miles with a duration of 273, what would the diameter be if the duration was 140? Well, notice that their first conditions are going to allow us to solve for K, right? And that's usually the first thing you have to do is solve for K in all of these proportional problems. So let's solve for K. Tell me what to fill in for D. Uh, K equals... No, first solve for, just let's fill in everything they've given us. They've given us a diameter of 302 miles. And they've also told us the time was what? 273. You have your calculator in front of you? 
in my backpack. Uh, yep. Then you can solve that for K. Better you do it than I do it, because you're going to be the one that has to do it. It's the first thing you need to do to solve this equation for K. Uh, take the cube root of 302. Okay, what is that? It's 302 to the one-third power. What is that? Some number less than 10. I know that. 6.709. Okay, we're going to 6.709. And that's now equal to K. What's the next step? Divide by Not, no. 273 squared. No, well, let's go ahead and square that. What's 273 squared? Seventy-four thousand five hundred twenty-nine. Okay, now solve for K. Seventy-four thousand five hundred twenty-nine. Give it to me as a decimal. Point zero 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 nine. Four zeros? Yeah. Okay. Now we have our perfect equation. In other words, now we know that D equals the square, the cube root of 0 0.00009 times T squared. So this is called our specific equation. In other words, this equation will work for all Hurricanes, as long as you know the duration of the hurricane, you can figure out its distance. There's only two variables in that. There's no K anymore. We took their first set of numbers, 302 miles with a duration of 273 hours, and we used that to solve for K. And then once you solve for K, you have the exact equation. This is more of a general equation where the K is still in there. Okay. Now, once we have the exact equation, then we can use it to predict the length or rather the diameter of any hurricane. And their next question says, well, what's the diameter of a hurricane with a duration of that? So tell me what the equation should read. D equals what? There's our equation. So it'd just be the cubed root of 0 0.0009. 140 squared. You got it. And that's going to be your answer. And I don't think we should take the time to have you do that on your calculator. That's not the problem. In other words, we've set the problem up, we've solved it, now we have an equation that's simple to solve on a calculator. Let's go on, okay? Okay. You might be able to get through all this stuff by Sunday. This is page three, right? So what's the answer to this question? Eight.
I'd say no, it isn't, right? Okay. What determines whether something's a function? Doesn't it have like a constant rate? It's got to have a. It's got to pass the vertical line test. Okay. So if I make that three thousand two fifty during week one, that's the value. Okay. After week two, it's 3,500. At week three, it's 3,450. Make sure you understand what I'm doing here, do you? Just plotting. I'm doing a scatter plot of this table. Week four, it's up to 3,700. Week five, it's back down to week two's level, 3,500. And week six, it's up to 3,800. Now, if I were to draw a line through those points, it would look like that. Is that a function or not? No. Yes, it passes the vertical line test. Remember that when you're trying to determine whether something is a function or not, you have to be able to pass a vertical line through any point on the curve and only come up with one value for y. Is that true here? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, what if I had a function that looked like this? Now, for that value of x, I got two values of y. That is not a function. And it does not pass the vertical line test. If I draw a vertical line through there, I get two values for y. So that's how you tell if something is a function of weak. Is, are there any values of weak where there are the same two values for y. And no, you can actually tell that immediately because weeks go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There are no duplications. So it doesn't matter what y is, the account balance, at the end of any of those weeks. I could make up any numbers you want, and it's still going to be a function of week. The only way that's not a function is if you were to have a week one and then have another week one, and they produce two different account balances. Concept of a function is pretty important. Most important thing to know is that for a given value of x, whatever's on the horizontal axis, you can only have one value for y. You can't have multiple values for y. On the right, there's only one value for y. Now you'll notice that two of those y's are the same. That's okay. They come when x's are different. In other words, one of those 3500's comes at week two, the other comes at week five. That does not destroy it from being a function. What would destroy it from being a function is if I made that week two. And now in week two, you have two different account balances. Well, that doesn't work for anybody. So that's why functions are important. You got to make sure that for any given value on the independent variable, you have one and only one value on the dependent. You recognize this? Yeah, I recognize the equation. I just don't remember what it was from. That is the limit quotient definition for first derivative. So, actually, you don't need to know that. And even though that's what it is, and that's why they're giving you this problem, doesn't really have any bearing on how we solve this problem. Okay, here's what we need to know. P of T 
is 5 over t plus 1. But we also need to know that. What is p of t plus h? So that's what you have to figure out. What is p of t plus h? How do I figure that out? What do you do with whatever's in the parentheses? You, wait, you distribute the P to it? Plug it in for the variable. Oh, okay. Always. No matter whether it's a number or letters or constants, does not matter how complicated this is. You just plug it in wherever you see T. So tell me what P of T plus H is. Uh, the P times. Hold on. You plug it into this function. Wherever you see T, you plug in T plus H. That's all you do. Simple as that. And then it'd be over T plus H plus 1. You got it. That's the way you handle stuff in parentheses. Okay, so now we have P of T, and we have P of T plus H. So now it's just an algebra problem. In other words, they said, find out what it is, and then simplify it. Okay, well, what is it? I'm going to write it over here. What's P of T plus H? 5 over T plus H plus 1. Minus P of T. Uh, 5 over T plus 1. All divided by H. Okay. Now we have a complicated algebra problem. And you remember that the reason these are so difficult, in other words, this was the first part of calculus was having to do problems like this. And it's, that's tough calculus. How do I handle the numerator? How do I subtract fractions? They have to have the same base. They have to have a common denominator, not a base. Same common denominator. What's the common denominator going to be? My common denominator is going to go right here and right there. So what is it? When I have variables like this, how do I find a common denominator? You multiply the two. Yeah. So that's t plus h plus 1 times t plus 1. That's our common denominator. And you don't need to multiply those out. You'll see why. You never do. Always leave it unmultiplied out when it's in the denominator like this, even if it's the denominator of the numerator. Now, what is that got to be? Uh, five. Okay, the way you figure it out is make sure that when you put in whatever you put in there, that it's equal to this over here. In other words, the whole point when you're finding common denominators is that you do not change the fraction. There's no way I want to change the value of this fraction. So it would be 5t plus 1. There you go. Got to be 5. And that's one reason I don't multiply out the bottom. And it's because it's really easy to figure out if you've changed it if you don't multiply it out. In other words, if I put 5 times t plus 1, I can see instantly that that is the same as this over here, right? The t plus 1's cancel, and I've got what I started with. That's the key. When you find a common denominator, do not multiply them together. It'll make it harder to figure out whether you're doing it right. 
What goes in the upper right? 5 times T plus H plus 1. Okay, and now we're dividing the whole thing by H. First of all, let's, don't forget that we're dividing this whole thing by H. But for the moment, I want to simplify the numerator, and you'll see why after we do it. So here's the denominator of the numerator. It's T plus H plus 1. Boy, I can't believe how hard they made these problems. That's our common denominator. Now, distribute, simplify the numerator. What do you got? You got 5T plus 5. What's the rest of it? 5T plus 5H plus 5. Uh, 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 uh. This negative sign has to be distributed to every term. So negative 5t minus 5h minus 5. Now, this is what always happens when you're doing this first derivative definition. Is anything that doesn't have an h in it pretty much goes away. That 5t cancels out with that 5t. That 5 cancels out with that 5. And the only thing I have left is a minus 5h. Okay, so now we're going to rewrite. We got minus 5h over here on the left, still divided by this common denominator, and there's still no reason to multiply these two numbers together or these two variables. Just leave it like that. But I'm dividing by H. In other words, this is the original problem, now simplified somewhat. What can I do with those H's? Uh, factor How by H. How do you divide a fraction by H? You multiply the top by H. You multiply by the reciprocal of the fraction. Well, there's a 1 under that H. So instead of dividing by H, I'm going to multiply by 1 over H. Right? If I tell you to divide 1 third by 1 fourth, how do you do that math? Multiply 1 third by 4. Right. In other words, you reciprocate the denominator and multiply. That's what you always do, no matter the level of difficulty. You reciprocate the denominator and you multiply. Well, my denominator is a whole value. It's H. So if I want to reciprocate it, i got to stick a 1 under it. And then I'm going to multiply this whole thing by... Instead of dividing by H over 1, I'm going to multiply it by 1 over H. Now, look what happens to the H's. They cancel. They always will cancel. That's the beauty of this definition for first derivative. And so here's what I'm left with. I got minus 5 in the numerator, and I've got t plus h plus 1 times t plus 1, and the denominator there is my simplified answer. Now, the next question, if it was a calculus question, would be, what's the limit of that as h goes to 0? Well, minus 5 over t plus 1 quantity squared, right? As h goes to 0, but they didn't ask that because this is not a calculus test. But that's the reason they're giving you this problem, is they want to make sure your algebra is up to the task. In other words, you really should not be taking calculus if you cannot do that algebra that we just did. And that's some of the toughest algebra you're ever going to see. 
But that is the point of making sure that you know how to do that algebra in order to take calculus. And the algebra is never easy when you're using this limit definition. I mean, that always produces complicated algebra. And that's all it is, though, is once you set it up, then it's just a question of simplifying the algebra part. Next page, I guess. Whoop. Now, just because we get through this once doesn't mean you've learned it and that you could pass a test on it. Okay? So, um, are these the last two questions, 10 and 11? No, actually, it goes all the way up to 56. Holy crap. There's no way. Zach? There's no way we're covering all 56. But more importantly, each of these questions is, is difficult. And it takes like 10 to 15 minutes to cover each question. And even when we do that, I'm not sure you could do a similar problem on your own. So one of the reasons I suggest that we do this like over the course of a summer where we have a lot more time, because uh, there's no way we're doing 56 of these questions. We'll, we'll just keep going as far as we can go. I don't think it does any good to speed it up. Do you agree? I mean, if I were to speed up my explanation, you just, you'd be lost, right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. In other words, I, I can only go at a certain speed. And even that is kind of questionable. That last problem was the most difficult algebra we've ever done, you and I. Although, if you remember right, at the very first part of calculus, when we were doing those, they were tough. That was almost the toughest part of calculus, you agree? Was yeah. that limit definition of derivative? Yeah, I guess. I didn't like trick I that think much. it is. I've always felt it is because that's really where you get your pre calculus skills tested. In other words, there's no way to do those limit definitions if you're not really good at algebra. You got to be really have your algebra skills. And then a lot of calculus requires really good trig skills. So, I don't know. Uh, you you may end up actually benefiting from taking this other course. You might. It might not be in your best interest to jump straight into calculus. As much as I hate saying that, um, you need to work on your algebra and probably your trig and perhaps your geometry. Notice that we started this whole thing with formulas for the volume of those objects. So you need all three math skills. You need algebra, geometry, and trig. And you need to be good at all of them in order to really be good at calculus. Yep. <laughs> all right, let's look at 10. We don't have much time, but we, we can probably handle 10. What's the radius when it's first observed? Read the problem. T or R is the radius, and T is the number of minutes since the spill was first observed. So what is T when the radius of the spill is first observed? Zero. So what's R when T is zero? In other words, what's R of zero? That's the same as saying R of zero. B4. Yep. Express the area of the oil spill as a function of time. Well, we have the radius of the oil spill as a function of time. So what's area as a function of radius? It's the area of a circle. Circular area. 
uh, pi r squared. Okay. So instead of r, we got this r. So the area as a function of t is a equals 4 plus, ah, hold on. Area So if area is pi r squared, what's r? Uh, it would be... <coughs> Actually, excuse me. Let's just do it this way. There's an easier way to do it here. I was about to do it the hard way. Okay, here's our area right here. Only our area is a function of r. It's not a function of t. But we have r as a function of t. So let's combine the two. There's what r is. So take the r function and substitute it for the r function in area. So what's area? <coughs> Pi times... 4 plus 3, or the cube root uh, of t over 2. Squared. Right? Yeah. In other words, it's r squared. So we still have to square the r, and there's the r. So you're correct. All of that goes in parentheses. We square it. There's your area as a function of t. In other words, if you start out with the area as a function of r, and r is itself a function of t, then you can substitute that function for r, like we did. And so we end up getting this area function. Now, the next question says, find the exact time when the area of the spill is 81 pi square inches. How do I solve that? I'm looking at an area function that has two variables, area and time. So I can always tell what the area is as a function of time. But this is giving me an area, and they want me to find out when that happens. So what should I fill in for A? Time or read the words. Eighty one pi. Okay. That's what I fill in for A. So eighty one pi equals pi times four plus the cube root. Oh my I don't know why they make these so hard, but I guess they're really wanting to know whether you can do this algebra or not. Okay, now, here we have only one variable, t. We've filled in the a amount. So, now is all i got to do is solve that for t. Okay? Make sure you can do that, though. Because that's what this is really all about, is... Uh, uh, hold on a second. Let's see. Um, so here's what I got. I got 81 pi, that's the area, equals 4 plus the cube root of t divided by 2 squared times pi, pi r squared, that's r, in the parentheses. Okay, you with me? Yeah. Now, what's next step? Now you divide by pi, right? Now, next step. Uh, you take the square root of both sides? Yeah, normally that would give me a plus or minus 9, 
but obviously the only area I'm interested in is the plus end of it. So now I'm down to this. In other words, I've gotten rid of the square and I've gotten rid of the 81. Now what? Subtract four. So now we got five equals the cube roots of t over two. Now what? Multiply each side to the one third power. Actually, we want to cube both sides. In other words, this is to the one third already. In other words, I could have written this five equals t over two to the one third power. And now to get rid of the one third, I got to cube both sides, right? Yeah. In other words, I got to cube both sides. And that gets rid of that and that. And I end up with t over two equals five cubed, which is 125. What's t equal to? Two fifty. Now, you can see the practicality of this, right? In other words, all of these problems, they're difficult, but they're real problems. In other words, when an oil spill happens, and if they know how, how much time has elapsed, they know the area of the spill. But sometimes they don't know when the spill happened, but they see an oil spill and it's uh, 81 pi square inches. They can figure out when it happened by doing this math. All right. That's a good place to stop. There's one more question on there and we'll pick it up on tomorrow. Uh, 10 B. But. I don't know. You need to think about what's going to happen here. I guess we can just go ahead and have our session tomorrow and you can take your test on Monday. But I don't have high hopes for that if there are 56 questions to cover. Because at best, we're going to get through 13 or 14 tomorrow. In other words, we're only covering a fourth of the material in these three hour sessions that we've had. And that's not really enough time to cover 56 questions of degree of difficulty that these are. Okay. Okay. I guess I can, I can quickly, R of 16 means what's the radius of the spill after 16 minutes? R of two, what's the radius of the spill after two minutes? That's what those mean. That's the practical interpretation of them. So next time we can start on 11. And you may have to send me more stuff. Uh, I've got 11 on here, but that's it. So you might want to send me at least a couple more pages for tomorrow's session. Okay just so you don't have to, we don't have to take the time to do it during the session. Send me at least one page. Uh, we might get through slightly more than one page in an hour. So send two pages, the next two pages. Are some of these 56 questions trig? I'm sure they are. Um, there's a few, yeah. Yeah. And we haven't even talked trig yet, so. We got a fairly strong basic problem here, and I don't know what the best way to solve it is. There may no be, there may not be a solution to it. You may just have to take your test on Monday and get the best score you can, and whatever class they place you in, it's probably going to be the correct class. It wouldn't surprise me if you really need to take a pre-calc class again, despite the fact that you got an A in calculus in high school. You still need to be have those earlier math skills that I don't think you quite have yet. All right. Zach, I will talk to you tomorrow at noon. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.